Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, well, yeah, I'm happy to begin. So, the, pre the presentation is on practical music theory, um, and let me explain a bit more what that's going to be about. Um, so, what we're going to be talking about is mostly chord balancing. So, how to be tactical with your singing volume to enhance the expansion of chords. So, we are going to be doing some singing in the class. We're going to hear some examples. We're going to be looking at chords and identifying where the fourths and fifths are, because those are the important ones to, to, to know about when chord balancing. And yeah, we're going to sing it and hear the result. Stop me at any time if you have questions, by the way. I'll just keep going. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Cool, so um, I'm sure some of you have heard this concept before. I'll, I'll just discuss it in case you haven't. It's not, um, by the way, the balancing chord thing is not um, specific to barbershop because they talk about it in brass bands and other ensembles and string ensembles and stuff like that as well. Um, so balancing chords is important for barbershop because it helps the chords to expand. It also complements tuning. An unbalanced chord may sound out of tune even if the pitches are being sung accurately. Uh, here's a few basic ideas for balancing chords. The bass or whoever is on the bottom of the chord should be the loudest. Uh, we stack the parts up from there. So if the baritone is the next lowest, baritone should be the next loudest. Sometimes the lead is lower than the baritone, which is why it's good for the leads and baritones to know when, if I'm a lead, if I'm singing lower in the chord, I need to know that. It's useful information, usable information. And if I'm the baritone and I'm below the lead, that's usable information. And vice versa, when I'm on top, um, I kind of like to think about it as the, like, say I'm, I'm singing baritone, if I'm below the lead, I'm singing like a second bass. But if I'm above the lead, the lead's here and the baritone's here, then I'm singing like a second tenor. So it's kind of like be supportive under the lead or float above the lead and be more like a tenor. Um, but there's other, there's other, um, sort of fine detail stuff to do as well. Uh, the tenor is on top and usually the softest. Um, this is frequently called coning or the barbershop pyramid. Um, but the chord voicing matters as well. This is where some music theory knowledge comes in handy. Uh, a good general rule that I got from Joe Ceruti, sing fifths and fourths with equal volume and with octaves sing the top note half as loud as the bottom note. So nearly all chords will have a fifth or a fourth or an octave, or sometimes they'll have, say, a fifth and an octave. So it's good to be able to look at the chord and know, am I on the, like, if I'm seeing lead, I might be on the top octave with the bass. I need to be about half as loud as the bass. Because otherwise, I'm just going to sort of disrupt the overtones that the, the bass is producing. You're going to sit inside of the bass overtone if you're seeing that octave. But if I'm, say, let's say I'm still the lead, but there's a fifth between the bass and the lead, I'm going to actually sing that with equal volume, so to match the bass's volume, and that just helps the chords sound really solid and expand a whole lot more. By the way, I'll send this, um, I'll send this out later on. I think we might have a couple of people walking in. <laughs> All right, I'll sing this. Good morning, guys. Good morning. <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> We're just up to the very, um, most exciting slide ball. I'm just going to do a super quick recap for the folks who just walked in. So we're talking about practical music theory. We are mostly going to be talking about chord balancing today. We're going to hear some examples. <coughs> we're going to sing it and experience it ourselves. Um, so um, we just talked about balancing chords. And as a general rule in barbershop, we like to have a, a barbershop pyramid or cone of sound. In wherein the bass is the loudest, the lead and the baritone are in the middle, they're the sort of medium volume, and the tenor's up the top, up the lightest. So just like a pyramid of sound like that. Um, okay, and now, next slide. So who owns the chord? So, Flynn, you might remember this from the other night, the chordsman mm -hmm. rehearsal was talking about this. Um, so if you sing in an ensemble, uh, be it a quartet or chorus or whatever, and you want to help the chords expand, you need to know, moment to moment, who owns the chord. By this I mean, which voice parts have the most control over whether the chord expands or not. The answer depends on who is seeing the fifth or fourth interval in the chord. And so on paper, um, you can see in the top right there, there's a fourth and a fifth. So if, even if you're not great at music theory, sometimes you can just recognize it by the distance apart that the notes are. 
held super to, to the same clef, so the bass clef up with here. It gets a little bit trickier when you're looking at a, the bass and the lead because they're different clefs, knowing which one is what, um, knowing whether that's a fifth or a fourth apart or some other, uh, some other interval. In most chords, the bass will be singing either the root note or the fifth of the chord, and one of the other parts, usually the lead or the baritone, will be singing the other chord tone, which is going to be, let's say, let's say if, the, if the bass is on the root, let's say it's the baritone, the baritone's going to be on the fifth, um, but if the bass is singing the fifth of the chord, then the baritone will probably be on the root note, and forming a fourth. So we'll look at some examples in a second of, of chords there. Um, so whoever is singing as part of this interval should sing loud, and the other two parts should sing softer. So if a chord has a fifth on the bottom, and then up the, let's say it's a C, G, C, E, ba, ba, oh, sorry, ba, 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 so like one, five, one, three, then um, you want the, the people who are on the bottom singing the fifth to be loud and the other two to be softer. So this, this is kind of fitting into our Barbatron's pyramid kind of thing at the time. Um, Okay, in the below example from Sweet and Lovely, which is a barbershop polka standard, the baritone and bass have a fifth in the chord on nice. They should sing loud, the lead and tenor should sing softer for optimal balance and chord expansion. So, listen for this chord here at the end of the phrase. The bass sounds tremendously loud in this. <laughs> um, it's because he is a loud bass, but also the baritone is doing a good job of kind of making the bass sound good. Have a look here. Sugar and spice and So 
when we hear that chord, you'll hear that the lead and the bass are going to sing louder on that chord, and the barry and the tenor. Listen for them, just relative balance, they're a bit softer than the lead and the bass. Gals by the score and gals galore. So, a uh, heap, heap of bass in that sound. Gals by the score and gals galore. And the lead. Gals by the score and gals galore. Again, listen to those lead bass and see how loud they are. Gals by the score. Switched around a little bit here, but it's 
same kind of chord voicing. So you see up here, the root, the root note and the seventh are right next to each other, which is why the, the note here is one tone this way, one tone that way. Um, so they, they kind of feature that aspect of the voicing, because it's kind of exposed, it's, it's miles away from the rest of the chord. Um, and, but these guys are still going to play a very supportive role, so we still want like bass loudest, baritone loudest, and then those two, um, like not weak, but they're softest relative to the other parts, uh, and, but equal to each other, so we can hear that dissonance in that row. So. So this chord has an octave at the bottom, not a fourth or a fifth. Bass should be the loudest, and whoever is in, on the octave should be half as loud, and the third and fifth above should be soft. An argument could be made that the fifth on top can be slightly louder than the third. Experiment. Because because we do like to hear the third ring out, of, I mean, sorry, the, the fifth ring out a bit. Uh, in the last chord, the tenor is on the fifth. So we might want to hear maybe a little bit more tenor than lead. But see how, you probably recognize, some of you might recognize this one. Major. 
again, so this time the base of the root, it leaves on the fifth, so x to c is a fifth. Then we have, what's this called? A g? G7. A g7, yes, yep. Where's the fifth or fourth? Still the base of the barrier that we've bought. Yes, that's right, so here's the base barrier of the fourth. This kind of looks like a fifth, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, but what, why is it not a fifth? It's not the root. So is that a tritone? Yeah, it's a tritone. So it's actually like a another name for it, but it's really interesting fifth where so if that were an F sharp, that would be a fifth from B to F sharp. But it's B to F natural. So that's a, a tritone, one one smaller than a um, than a fifth. So this so we want base barrier to predominate on this chord. And then this chord's the same as the first one, so base barrier again. So I've just on the next slide marked it up so it's easy to remember what we've got. So <coughs> Yeah, it, if it's circled or squared with red, that means those are the notes that we need more of. So let's sing it. Um, <coughs> oh, we'll do, 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 do you always do me, me, ma, ma, me, rather than ma, me, me? Yeah, can we just expose the, this 
to the leading bass for a second so we can hear that second pause and make sure that's tuned up. Go. Me.
Yeah. <laughs> the same voice. <laughs> yeah. um, like my wild Irish rose. So there's kind of two field chords there. But like for instance, the, the chord on Rish. My wild Irish rose. There's like you have to go harder on that. So it's not that important to, to get this balance up right there. Um, yeah. yeah. Would Or Good question. Um, most of the time, yes. Just because of the way we arrange barbershop music, the bass is nearly always on the root note or the fifth of the chord. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 If it's like, except for like passing things, are purely short. But when we're looking for the rest of the chord, yeah, we will almost always have bass. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, almost always. I can think of one exception in like. Um, my chorus sings Oh Holy Night with Christmas Carol and there's a bit where the, the melody because it goes low, the bass actually goes above the lead and so there's a bit between the lead and the baritone I think uh, and so that would be an interesting time where the bass actually needs to back off and the lead and the baritone are kind of the lead indicators in that chord um, that's a pretty rare exception but right. <laughs> I might make them a rare exception Maybe just do this one more time before I'll look at I'll show you a couple of other examples and discuss this stuff more at length. But let's see this one. Me you have to do tenor again? Here we go. One, two, but we're gonna block each chord, okay? And just take a breath when you need to. Here we go.
two weeks that it's not there. But it's also, it's kind of going to feel like, if the, if the truth is tuned out, it's going to feel like the bird is already existing, kind of, like it's being produced, and you're just filling in, you know, it's like, you're, the, you're filling in the sandwich. <laughs> so the sandwich, the bread is there, and you're just a nice filling in the middle. Don't need to, like, overdo it. Yeah, that was really puny. But, yeah. And I think they can kind of, they warm the cord up, they make it sound sort of sunshiny and warm. Yeah, I have a silly question. How can it be already there if you don't know the class of bird? Like, because... Good point, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the major bird is uh, a more constant interval than a minor okay. bird. So it actually exists lower in the harmonic series than the, than the minor bird does. And so if the ear is going to sort of guess what bird it is, it's probably going to be a major bird over the minor bird. So do you, do you mean that there is actually a harmonic there, or your brain is just sort of hearing it? Well, it could be both. Actually, it's probably more so the latter because <coughs> if the bass is like singing nice, lots of ring and overtones, the third that will appear will actually be up here. It's not here, overtones. Yeah, because it'll be, it'll produce a fifth and a third octave and third if it's really nicely in tune. So it really will be sort of ringing that one, but yeah. Yeah, anyway, me, me, ma. Tenor, does this mean I never get to sing loud? Not necessarily. If there's a tenor feature, you might deprioritize balance because you want to draw attention to the beautiful tenor melody. But generally, if you want to expand the chords, you'll need, to, you'll need the tenor to sing with the lowest volume. Um, there's a wonderful video on YouTube called Ready, Set, Sing, and it's um, sort of like a how-to barbershop course. Um, Darren Drown, who is the baritone from Stormfront Quartet is, is teaching. Um, I'll bring it up in a minute actually and show you at the end. But um, in it, he does, he does a really good example of like, he gets a quartet <coughs> and has him sing like an unbalanced chord and then fix the balance like halfway through the chord. And so he has the tenor sing really loud and the bass sing really soft. And it's in tune and it's 
sounds pleasant, but then when they fix the balance, the tenor backs off and the bass comes forward in the sound, it suddenly you hear the expansion. It's just like, oh, it expands now. Um, and it's almost like the, vo the individual voices disappear because you get that really homogenous uh, ringing sound. Um, so it's a really nice example of that. But yeah, I know if you're a tenor, it's like, but I want to sing loud. <laughs> and there are exceptions to the rule, but if you want to make the chords ring more, you kind of need to have that spirit that's kind of thing going on. Um, question, but we're singing a tender ballad. Singing loud would ruin the mood. And the answer is, it's all about relative volume. You can have softer sections of a song, but if you want the chords to still ring, you'll need the fourths and fifths to be the loudest notes in the chord. Um, my favorite quartet has a lead that always sings loud. What's going on here? So it could be that the lead's voice is predominant because of other factors, the timbre or tone of their voice, their articulation or inflections, the fact that they're singing words while Harmony Park are singing ooh, Leads who know how to balance chords will serve their quartet better when it comes to creating an expanded sound. Um, so there's a few really good ensemble leads would include like Eric Dalby from Vocal Spectrum or Rasmus from Ringmasters or Rick Midoff from Acoustics. These guys, um, they could deliver a, a beautiful kind of lyric melody, but when it came time to say like, hold a chord and ring the hell out of it, they knew how to like make their voices just vanish and by vanish I mean like sing the appropriate balance. Um, so if they're lowering the chord with the bass on a fifth, they would like sing loud and the barry would back off. Or if it's if it's a bass barry kind of chord where the bass barry on that chord, the lead will back off and just kind of become a chord tone. Um, jumping between sort of that like I'm a soloist with three backup singers and like I'm part of this ensemble and I'm just want to vanish my voice into the sound. Um, yeah, so those, those three guys I think are really, really good at it. Um, there are other leads that don't do that so much, and they're sort of more like solo team soloists most of the time, and let those guys try and balance chords around them. Uh, and some melodies lend, it, lend themselves to that more than others, honestly. Like, um, they kind of, because of where it sits in the range, it might be that the, um, it's just difficult to sing that note soft, or it's difficult to sing that note loud because of where it sits. Um, so, you know, every song's going to be a little bit different, but be tactical about where you, you know, how you choose to be loud or soft. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Oh. Um, so in terms of like balancing, um, singing like louder versus soft, uh, so for tenor, right? Like what about like a, a softer Roger Ross versus like a more predominant like David Zimmerman? How does that work out? Yeah, um, I think, well, both of those guys obviously know how to sing really well in tune. So it's like the tuning is, is absolutely fine. Um, I think with David Zimmerman's an interesting one. It's, I think the, the, it's almost the quality of his voice makes his voice stick out a bit, like something about the, the timbre of his voice. Um, but he, I mean, he's also a very smart singer. He'll know when to, when to not be predominant in the chord. And usually if you notice him, it's because he wants to be noticed. <laughs> it's because he's decided this is a tenor moment. Mm. Um, but interesting, within that quartet, like um, in the middle of that quartet with Theo and Cole, those guys know how to like just vanish into the chord if they want to. But Theo's got an interesting, like he's, he's a very characterful lead. Mm. Um, and he'll do tons with the expression and the articulation that'll draw your, your ear to his voice. Even though his like volume He's not singing louder than the rest of the guys because you've got <laughs> Kyle on bass and David on tenor who are tremendously loud at both of their parts. Um, and yet, you know, we never lose Theo. We're never like, where'd he go? <laughs> <laughs> Except in some moments, there's extended, like, crazy chord swipe and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. which chord change is this? Oh, instant classic. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, great chord really wonderful. Um, but yeah, every quartet is a bit different, everyone's got different voices. It's kind of about like knowing what's, knowing which voices are in the quartet and being tactical and figuring out what, what works for you. So, yeah. Mm. How does this work in a larger than quartet um, Yeah. Well, I mean, I've just started sort of talking about it with the, the chordsman 
And I did just that. So we would um, we sang a tag in rehearsal the other night, and we had it up on the screen. I was pointing at chords and going, "Okay, this chord, bass and Barry, you own this chord. This chord, lead and bass, you own this chord." And then we sang the, the, the tag slowly and just stopped on those chords and go, "No, leads you too loud. You see, this is a bass Barry chord. You got to back off. Bass and Barry, need more baritone." Uh, and then just go next chord, next chord, next chord. And it's at the moment it's pretty slow going, but um, I just want to, and we'll probably mark up some of our scores like this and just go, okay. Key moments in the piece. Um, Barry's and basses, this is your chord. Leads and basses, this is your chord. Or, you know, hopefully there'll be a moment for the tenors somewhere in there as well. Um, but, yeah, again, it's not about like knowing every single chord, but it's about picking your moments and going like, this is a really important chord to ring. Um, let's optimize our balance to make that ring a little bit more. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I've got a couple of other things I can show you. We're almost out of time. It's good time. Um, so one of the things was... So they're going to be loud, even if they're not singing loud, just because by sheer volume. And the tenors, which are few, I probably need them to sing louder. In, you know, in, in a, maybe in, if I had the time, I might recruit some of the leads to sing that first tenor, like the first bar of the tenor notes. It's those ba ba I've been to cities, and as soon as we move off that first chord, like tenors are now in the third of that chord. And so in this chord, the fourth is there between bass barry, and then immediately switches to lead bass as the fourth. And it switches back. There's a lot of switching that happens here just because of the nature of this melody. But looking this bar here, that's bass barry's town because it's just like fifths, the whole thing there. But yeah, that's, I just want to show you that one. That's an interesting one where the tenors are in the fifth. That's because it's a very closely voiced chord. It's just root, third, fifth, and the barrys and the basses are sharing that. That doesn't have happen very often, but it just it happened to work well for this, for the voice leading of this, this chart. Um, let me show you real quick the... As soon as he came on, I had everything fixed. So if you guys can kind of stay about medium if I can. Start with us, go a little slower from the box. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it makes 
setting lesson four. It's all good. Uh, he's, a, he's a great teacher. Um, he's, you should check out his quartet, Stormfront, wonderful quartet. He's actually a natural bass. It's Stormfront's a really interesting quartet because you've got three guys that are natural basses and then a lead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Jim Clark is like a beautiful lead with a nice high voice. In fact, he'd be a great tenor. It's almost like three basses and a tenor. Um, but we've got a bass singing tenor, a bass singing baritone, and a bass singing bass, and then a guy on lead. <laughs> but yeah, they, they make it work and they're, they're just great. Uh, I think we're out of time, but any other questions? No, thank you so much for coming along and participating. Um, and yeah, this is my, my new idea about how to, you know, who owns the chord? How to, how to, how to balance the chords properly. And, and uh, uh, patented Dan method. Patented, yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure our other handouts get.